Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela McKay, and I'm Director of Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy at Microsoft. As we've heard throughout the sessions, and as everyone in the room knows, technology has brought great advances to our economy, national and homeland security, and to societies around the world. And these advances will only continue as the next two billion users come online, primarily from the global south, and other trends like mobility and cloud computing. Yet at the same time, technology is being used, abused, and exploited to cause considerable and sometimes even catastrophic harm. In today's session, we are fortunate to have to speak with David Sanger, National Security Correspondent for the New York Times, and Richard Leggett, Deputy Director at the National Security Agency, to talk about security challenges in the ever-evolving cyber realm. Thank you. And over to you, David. Oh, and don't forget, David's book is for sale, along with many others, in the back. Well, thanks. It's always good to do a session midday Saturday uh, at this uh, because you discover who the truly dedicated <laughs> Aspen Security Forum folks are, which is to say those who haven't flown the coop on Friday night or are you know out on the trails in the river now. So, so you're the you're the crowd that, that truly cares. It's um, great to be here uh, with uh, Rick Ledger, who spent uh, just about his whole career in signals intelligence and most of it at the NSA, right? Uh, and was um, unknown to the world until he uh, burst onto the 60 minute screen uh, a few months ago in describing the Snowden um, uh, investigation and we'll get to that uh, pretty soon. But um, I, I've gotten in the past year to uh, know Rick a little bit and um, uh, I'm delighted that you're here and uh, thank you for coming to, to go do this. Um, let's just start with just a brief moment of discussion on um, current events. In the past week, we have seen the intelligence community actually share some intel in a way that you haven't seen in quite some time, publicly share it. First on the MH17 shootdown, where there was a, a remarkable briefing at the Director of National Intelligence Office where they sort of laid out their case somewhat circumstantial, but the case that this was uh, Russian-made equipment, not clear if it was being manned by Russians or Ukrainian separatists, and, and put that case together. And in fact, yesterday, the White House spokesman, Josh Hearn, has said, we have to conclude, we have concluded that Vladimir Putin and the Russians are culpable to this tragedy. That was his direct quote. And then on Friday, we saw more evidence released of heavy arms that were being moved over the border less than a week after the shootdown. So just give us a little sense of how this is collected, what role the NSA plays versus the others, and then how the decision is made to take something that's obviously pretty classified and gives a sense of our capability and the decision made to actually go make it public. Sure. So I think um, what, what I'd like to do is make this a little more generic than this particular instance. Uh, sources and methods are always something that, that we're concerned about. But I do want to give folks uh, an understanding of, of how the different elements of the intelligence community relate. And so in a, in, in a case like this, we would have the efforts of, of my organization, uh, the National Security Agency, which is focused on the signals intelligence mission. And so we're looking for things from, uh, from communications or from, uh, from weapon systems, emanations. Uh, we've got the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency that's looking for, uh, for phenomena <coughs> in, the, in the imagery uh, realm, whether that's uh, electro-optic photography or infrared or other sources of information. And then, of course, you have the human intelligence uh, uh, activities of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency, and then open source information. And we work also across with, with all uh, relevant partners who have a capability in or interest in the area. And so the community will take all that information, they'll fuse it under the auspices of, um, of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency or, uh, and the DNI, and they'll produce an assessment. And then that then goes to policymakers to inform their decisions and their um, activities in terms of 
what do we want to do, what do we want to do to make public in order to support the policy, uh, act, uh, policy goals of the administration. Does it set a precedent when you make this kind of thing public that you worry about because then people will come back to you and say later in this conflict, well, you were willing to tell us about this, so tell us what you're seeing the Russians do now? So, so we did this in, in, uh, in the early 80s with the shoot down of KL Flight 007, where President uh, Reagan read the transcript of the air traffic controller to the Russian pilot that shot down the, uh, the uh, jetliner uh, right. over the Kamchatka Peninsula. And so I think. Um, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, think yep. of Adlai Stevenson, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, there, are, there are times when that's really important and where you need to, to do that. As a rule, uh, we don't do that uh, because it does potentially impact sources and methods. And in this particular case, how granular do you think that the intelligence is going to get going forward about the shoot down of the airliner in a way that might be able to establish who was actually commanding the shoot down, whether the signals intelligence would give you a sense of whether this was, uh, whether the order to pull the trigger was on the ground, was coming from Russia, was coming from some other set of commanders? Yeah, I, I can't really talk about that in any level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the community is working really hard to provide as much fidelity to the, to the White House and, uh, and the uh, rest of the policymaking community as they can in this case, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. So. Well, let's move on to the Snowden investigation. You, um, you took a bit of a, a career detour. You were running <laughs> NTOC, right, the, uh, the uh, Cyber Threat Center, which we will come back and discuss in a little bit, and spent just about a year on running, I think, what you called the Media Leaks Task Force. Mm -hmm. I thought the name was interesting because it, it suggested that the problem was a media leak instead of, say, an insider threat. You could have called it the Insider Threats Task Force. So let's start with the name. Why was it called that, and what does that tell us about what the, how the NSA perceived the problem? So I think uh, the, the, the name was, was um, you know, we tossed around all kinds of different names early on, and the name was something that was, we thought was suitably bureaucratic and, and <laughs> descriptive enough that it, <laughs> that it wasn't overly descriptive. We, we, we didn't want to put a person's name on that. Uh, but we wanted to, uh, to make sure that, that in our early thinking on that, it was the media leaks that were the issue, the exposure of our capabilities in the, in the press. It's interesting because to many in the outside, as you know, the question was less one of the leak than whether some of the activities that were revealed were ones the U.S. government wanted to be engaging in. And while you, I think, made a pretty persuasive case that they were legal within the constraints of the law that Congress had passed, mm -hmm. you saw the president decide in January that some of the activities that had gone on would be terminated or changed. There were two areas, bulk collection was one, and listening in on some leaders, not all, some world leaders, where he stood up and said, we're gonna stop doing this or we're gonna change the way we're doing this or change the mechanism so that there isn't the fear or the potential for abuse. So, do you think in using the phrase Media Leaks Task Force, the NSA was in any way deflecting away from the question of whether the, acti the underlying activities were what the country wanted the NSA doing? So I think uh, I wouldn't read that much into the name. We were under uh, an incredible amount of pressure, um, you know, working 20-hour days uh, on a pretty consistent basis in order to, to address the issues because uh, the task force was concerned with a lot more than just the media leaks as aspects of it. We were working the, uh, the internal remediation, we were working uh, foreign relationships, we were working uh, the relations with Congress, uh, with uh, the White House, with the rest of the intelligence community, and so it was, it was a, a very broad remit. Um, and so uh, I wouldn't get too, too concerned about the name. Um, I would like to steal something from, I think he's still here, um, General Mike Hayden, our former director, there he is and director of CIA, he, uh, in a conversation, I believe it was at Duke University, described uh, a box around what the IC does. That box is comprised of law and policy. And so the activities that we do need to remain inside that box, and, and they do. And so we work really, really hard to make sure that that's the case. And there are, periodically, the boundaries of that box will change. 
uh, and if and as those boundaries change because of policy in the case of the president's decisions in PDD 28, or in the case of laws that come out, then we'll adapt to remain within that box. But what the nation should expect, and I think what surprised some people, was how well we work within that box. We color in every iota of space because that's our job, that's our duty, and we would be derelict in our duty if we didn't fully exercise the authorities that we had. And so the conversation that's happened since then, since this visibility into, into that thing, in a way that, um, that uh, called a lot of attention to it, uh, has sort of uh, helped people understand how well we color within those lines. Now, when we last checked in with you about how much data you'd actually lost, the initial projection was that Snowden probably had had access to about 1.6 million documents, something in that, in, that vicinity. in that vicinity. But there was some question about how many he actually left with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the time that you did your 60 Minutes interview, you were still trying to get a handle on mm -hmm. that. Can you give us an update on where, what, what, how much you actually think he left with as opposed to what he might have seen? So some of that's investigative material. There's still an active ongoing investigation with, uh, uh, led by the FBI and with participation from, from our folks. So um, I, I will be a little circumspect. But the question is how much of it that he touched he actually took and how much of it that he actually took he gave to people versus you know, locked away somewhere. And, and those are unknowns to us at this time. Okay, so he's still not, not clear on that. Mm -hmm. One of the remarkable things just in reporting on how he did this that we came across was that he had taken an extremely inexpensive web crawler, a, a program you can buy for maybe a hundred bucks. You could probably write one yourself if you had the, the talents for it, um, that went out and searched through the system, basically gobbling up different elements of the sites, bringing those back, and then as you say, we don't know how much he actually put on a thumb drive and took off with. Um, he was able to do this without detection in the system that was running in Hawaii. If somebody was in any corner of the NSA's databases today and running a web crawler, could it go undetected? No. So we have uh, um, a variety of measures that we've taken to uh, lock, down, uh, lock down our network um, th under three broad, uh, broad headings. Uh, it's uh, oversight of the people, um, control of the data, and control of the network. And so um, I don't want to get too much into the details of that because I don't want to give a playbook to anybody who wants to circumvent those. But there's uh, 42. Believe me, nobody who would come to the Aspen Security <laughs> Forum would even think of doing a thing like that. <laughs> so there's, there's 42 specific things that, uh, that we've uh, d uh, either completed or in the process of completing in order to, to do that. And we've there's actually a lot of uh, good lessons learned there uh, that we are sharing with uh, our, our uh, fellow IC members as well as with the Department of Defense and other interesting folks. And do you plan to share those outside the U.S. government? I mean, obviously there are many people here who are working on corporate yep. systems and you know, they face a very similar kind of insider threat concern. And so what we'll do, is, what we are actually doing is rolling those into best practices that we recommend and, and as we participate in, um, in the activities of folks in the information security and computer security business as we uh, take those recommendations and roll them in without attributing them to any one particular thing. Let's talk for a moment about the damage assessment. We've heard two different things that are not necessarily contradictory but leave different impressions. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Bob Litt, the uh, general counsel for the DNI, was up on this stage a day or two ago and said that he had sat in a briefing just in the past week, heard about a major terrorist organization that had um, changed, that was overheard changing the way it communicates because of things that they had learned from the Snowden leaks. On the other hand, your boss, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, while making the same point in an interview I did with him last month, then also said to me, you know, David, he said, I wouldn't say the sky is falling. By that, I assume that he meant that it's the nature of this business that your adversaries are always getting better and your protections always have to move on and the amount of damage done is, is time limited. So give us your perspective on both Mr. Litt's assessment and and Admiral Rogers. Sure. So what uh, what Bob said was right, uh, despite the fact that he's a Yankees fan. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, he, um, uh, th there, there was a briefing like that. And in fact, there have been dozens of terrorists and terrorist organizations that have um, looked at the things that have been published about our capabilities and taken actions to try to remove themselves from our view. Um, so when people say that, uh, that there has been no real damage done by, uh, by the disclosures, they are categorically wrong, and, and our hope is they're not catastrophically wrong. Uh, or the, there's a level of risk that accrues when these things are, uh, are disclosed. Uh, it's incremental level of risk. It's hard to say that there is one disclosure leads to one terrorist activity, but uh, our view is that the incremental exposure of our people, and by our people I mean our diplomats overseas, our, our intelligence operatives overseas, our military overseas, and our people here in the homeland increases a little bit every time that happens. And there's a danger there. That's the frog in the pot, you know, as the temperature slowly gets turned up, and before you know it, you're, uh, you're, you're in uh, some pretty serious uh, consequences. Um, and I think that, that the, the difference between that uh, and what Admiral Rogers said is, you know, what Admiral Rogers uh, was talking about was it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the SIGINT system. We're continuing to produce signals intelligence on a variety of, of activities, including on terrorism. But the, the concern gets to be when our view into operational activities and operational planning activities is, is circumscribed by target actions. Is there any way to quantify that? So, and they're getting better in part because of what they've read in the mm -hmm. Snowden documents and in part because they're just working harder at this. You're getting better over time, mm -hmm. presumably, because that budget's got to be going for something, right? So, um, so along the way, do you have a sense of what percentage of um, capability or insight into foreign systems you have lost mm -hmm. in the past year? That's a really difficult question to answer because there, there are indeterminates. There are things that are a direct result of, of Snowden. There are things that are a normal result of the way people change their communications because new technologies become available or, say, a foreign uh, military goes through a regularly scheduled communications change. There's, there's just, uh, I don't really think there's any way to quantify it. I would say that in some of these cases, our ability is a fingernail's breadth. And so when something happens, that causes that to change, uh, it can be difficult to impossible to, uh, to recover that. So the president appointed a um, commission that reported back last mm -hmm. December, and they had some very specific recommendations for, uh, for the NSA. One of them that jumped out at me is one that we've discussed in the, the uh, corporate uh, realm as well uh, over the past few days here. They said that all of the data at rest should be um, uh, encrypted, uh, as rather than simply encrypting data when it is moving, say, from one server to another, which is which is usual. And they were quite emphatic in this in this recommendation. Uh, and yet, I've gotten a sense from uh, talking to some of your colleagues that that proposal has run into some technological and policy problems within the NSA. So. Yeah, Tell so, us what the concern is. So uh, <coughs> let me uh, lift this up just a little bit and, and talk about the pros and cons of, of encrypting uh, uh, data at rest. The pros are uh, it makes it more secure. Um, the uh, cons are it, uh, it's expensive. It's expensive in terms of the um, compute power that you need to use to decrypt it every time someone searches against it or, or wants to access it. It is um, uh, expensive in terms of the volume. NSA has uh, a lot of data in, it, in its databases, you may have read that. Um, the, uh, and so, so the scale is, uh, is uh, intense. We're looking at things like digital rights management and looking at how do we encrypt data at rest in a way so that if it's removed from the network, it doesn't, uh, it's just a featureless stream of ones and zeros. And so we're working our way through that in order to, to address that. It's not an easy, oh, go buy a box off the shelf and plug it in and you're done. It's, it's more complex than that. So, so, so what we're doing is we're focusing on the most important data to secure first and then working our way out from that. 
So if you're Snowden and you had a certain number of credentials to get into the system, presumably mm -hmm. those credentials would also allow you to de-encrypt the system. So, so that's actually a great question um, or statement. Uh, the, what we're going towards is uh, something that's called uh, uh, attribute-based access control. And so you as an individual have certain attributes, you have certain permissions, you have certain um, legitimate uh, uh, interests where someone has said, yeah, you're, you're authorized to see X, 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 and X. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we do is part of this is we tag the data with attributes of the data. And so it has to be that combination of the data's attributes and your attributes and where they match, you then get access to that. So that's the system that we're building. And there's an alarming system, I assume, you put in that would, that would indicate if a large amount of data is being taken out. We were told by the Pentagon that's what they were doing after WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. uh, as you look across the government enterprise, has that kind of alarm system been widely uh, installed? So I think uh, different agencies have different levels of progression. That's an executive order. I think it's 13587 is the executive order that was issued post WikiLeaks that mandated a set of activities. And all the agencies have their own timeline in order to, uh, to achieve that. Um, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with Google, Microsoft, uh, ISPs, um, people who people who have reserved tables down here. Okay. Um, I think it's fair to say that from the creation of the NSA in 1952 forward, you developed some very close relationships that frequently were based on trust. And so while sometimes you had to go off and get a warrant or a, some other form of court order, you could frequently go to the senior executives of some of these companies, or even people you've gotten to know, and get a lot of cooperation just on the side. And we're thinking through the Cold War and really up until recent times. Um, the reaction we've seen in the past year is sort of the opposite of that. I was out of Google a few months ago and visited the center that they have dedicated to sealing up all the holes that we learned from the Snowden documents that your colleagues had niftily bored through server to server communications and so forth. Are you finding that the nature of the relationship with American business has fundamentally changed? I think that the, uh, the Snowden uh, disclosures um, put a, the number of our industry um, partners in a, in a tough situation because most of their business is overseas, not in the United States. And so, the, um, the commentary about protections of Americans' uh, information doesn't really resonate well with folks who aren't Americans because they say, hey, what about me? Uh, and, and part of that was the reason that the president uh, gave the guidance that he did in PDD 28 about the uh, personal information of, uh, of uh, foreign uh, citizens, um, citizens of foreign countries. And so the, um, the it's, we have a number of shared interests with, with American industry. It's in, it's in our interest that um, you know, they build the best and most secure products in the world. It's in our interest that those products be deployed around the world and used by Americans and used by people uh, all over the world uh, for the safety of commerce and the safety of, uh, of legitimate uh, activities. At the same time, we have a responsibility to when people who are uh, adversaries of the United States, people who, who actually went to harm us, like terrorists, like weapons proliferators, like drug smugglers, like people smugglers, they use those same capabilities. And so we have a responsibility to, to try to um, see the information within them. And so what, uh, what we are working towards is a regime where we can, under law enforcement sorts of, uh, or rather a legal uh, authorization sort of approach, compel them, and companies want to be compelled. They, they are compelled all around the world in terms of countries come to them and say, you know, give me information about these particular things under whatever the legal regime is. And so that's, that's actually, the, I think, the place where the companies can say, we have to do this because it's the law of the land, uh, and it gets them out of a cooperation place. We're also seeing cases, one we discussed the other day, the, uh, the case involved, the Microsoft is challenged involving um, Ireland. Uh, where data is being stored in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, when we all store our data in the cloud, we have no idea where it is, if it's in the United States or outside. Um, 
And you're running into trouble now about what your extraterritorial reach might be. Uh, because you could have an American company storing data overseas. Is this posing a new kind of challenge to you? We're still working through that. It's uh, potentially uh, a challenge. There are, um, you know, there will likely be um, uh, proposals that are put forth by, by us, by folks in the, in the uh, administration to how do we address that. So I don't want to get ahead of that. Um, another proposal in the Presidential Commission report was that the NSA should do nothing to weaken commercial encryption. Mm -hmm. And I know this has been something people have been trying to work through in the past six months since that report came out. Um, tell us where that stands. So that's actually, uh, there's been a study group led by uh, Michael Daniels in the White House uh, that's been working through that since the, since the issuance of the report. And we're almost at the finish line uh, on that. So um, I, I'm not going to predict a date because uh, I've been in government long enough, long enough to know that that's a fool's errand. But we are, we are I, would, I would say maybe weeks, not months. And can you give us any preview of sort of whether or not you suspect significant changes in the way you've been operating? I'm let Michael have the joy of uh, rolling that out. I'm sure he's looking forward to he that. Is, he yeah. is. Um, a last question along those lines. You've said many times that the NSA does not put back doors into, into systems. Um, and yet, at various moments, we have seen the NSA exploit back doors that may be in systems unintentionally. Tell us a little bit about the difference and how you think about that. So I think the, um, there, was a, there was a really great blog posting that, uh, again, Michael Daniel uh, put on the web. If you haven't read it, I, I urge you to recommend it. That talks about vulnerability and the responsibility of government to disclose vulnerabilities that it finds. And so that's this was his zero days blog post, right. right? Yeah. And so we take that very seriously, and we have an internal process that we use that is biased towards disclosure. Um, and there are uh, folks here in the room who've been the beneficiary of that. Um, and the um, those cases where we elect not to disclose, there's a variety of things that go into that decision. That's how how significant is the vulnerability? How accessible is it, it to other people? Is it something that a that a you know, relatively unskilled hacker could use, or is it something that takes the resources of a nation state? Is it something that uh, has uh, long-term lasting effects? If, if, the, if the question is, do we keep it for intelligence uh, uh, use, how important is that intelligence? Is there another way to get that? Are there alternatives to that? And so, as I said, um, uh, we at NSA are heavily biased towards defense in that regard, um, uh, about uh, you know, in the nine out of 10 range. So it's very, uh, very much something that we pay a lot of attention to. What's happened since the, uh, since the review group and their recommendation is the White House has instantiated a uh, policy and a process that raises that to that level and factors in inputs from, from all the agencies. One last question before we move on to your role in cyber before the Snowden stuff. You famously uh, said in that 60 Minutes interview that you thought that you could imagine the need to strike a deal with Snowden at some point so that you had an understanding of what it was he took and bring him back. Um, you took a little heat for that. Uh, still your thought? And um, what do you think the chances are that's going to happen at some point? So I was, I've been misquoted on that so many times, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. What I said was it was worth a conversation. I wouldn't just categorically say uh, uh, no conversation about, about that. Um, I think that as time goes on, the utility for us of having that conversation becomes uh, less. Uh -huh. So um, the you know it's been over a year since he had access to uh, to our networks and the information they're on, and so um, the 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 need for us to understand that at a greater level of detail, I think, is is lesser and lesser. Huh. That's separate and apart from the the need for the U.S. justice system to bring him back and hold him accountable, which is outside my purview. That's, that's more in the attorney general's realm. Well. But the, the essence of what you're saying is you now have a greater and greater understanding over time of what's out, what isn't out, and therefore your need to sort of get him to come explain what he did has, has diminished considerably. Partly that and also partly the fact that um, the, the telecommunication system is the Global telecommunication system is the most complex system ever designed uh, and built by man. Uh, it changes very quickly. 
Uh, and so as time goes on, his information becomes less useful. That's interesting. Great. So before you ever heard of Edward Snowden, you ran something called NTOC, which most Americans have no idea what it is. So start by telling us what it is. Sure, it's the uh, NSA uh, Threat Operations Center focused on cyber threat. Um, do, they do two things. They, uh, they inform and they counter. They inform uh, the community on foreign cyber threats and they do that by leveraging the, uh, the totality of the signals intelligence system and the information assurance uh, centers. NSA has two missions, signals intelligence, information assurance. In the first, our job is to find out what, uh, what people are doing by, uh, foreign intelligence targets are doing by looking at their communications and reporting that back to the, to the intel community, the policy making community. On the information assurance side, our job is to design and provide protection for national security systems, so US government systems that carry classified information. Uh, and so in that latter mission, we have sensors on those like principally DOD networks where we see threats that hit the network boundary. And so we take our foreign intelligence information and our information assurance mission, we put that together and we identify threats, cyber threats to the US. We share that information with the FBI, with the DHS, with other relevant uh, agencies and through them with uh, American uh, industries and companies that are the targets uh, of those particular uh, cyber threat actors. The, um, sorry, you were gonna say something. No, I was just yeah. gonna say, you mentioned sensors on the DOD systems, but of course, most of the attacks we're seeing happen, as we'll get into in a moment, are happening on commercial systems. Do you have any visibility into those? We don't, we, we uh, our sensors are overseas, are deployed overseas, are looking at foreign entities. We'll see them coming inbound for the US sometimes, and when we see that, then we'll, we'll alert. Or um, uh, we have other ways of, of identifying when a cyber actor has achieved uh, access to a system, and we tip that out. I don't wanna get into the details of that because, again, that's sources and methods. But we tip that out to, as I said, the Bureau or DHS for them to, to uh, warn people. Um, and I would just like to say that uh, it is a very, very rich cyber threat environment. There are, um, there are a number of uh, folks out there who are working very hard to build their cyber capability and they're exercising their capability against that. I think the, the Chinese theft of intellectual property is pretty well established. It's been published at the unclassified level by the Director of National Intelligence Counterintelligence Center. Um, our counterintelligence executive. It's, uh, there are, um, to my knowledge uh, today, several nation states who have uh, developed and executed programs to get on the um, systems that control things like the power grid, things like that, and it makes you wonder what's the purpose of that. So uh, all that information has been shared with the right folks. Interesting you mentioned that because the prosecution that we saw of the Chinese was all for intellectual property. And when you hear the president talk about this, he almost always talks about it in intellectual property theft terms because that's sort of safe ground. There's, a, there's pretty much universal, at least in the West, concept that if stealing intellectual property is a violation of many agreed upon international regulations and laws. But what you're just describing, which is going into power plants that you might be able to take over and so forth, um, that's in some ways the nightmare that keeps you awake at night. And on the other hand, it doesn't seem to be covered by what the United States has at least publicly complained about. So I think there's, uh, th there's a couple issues there. One is um, international norms for cyber. There, there really aren't. That's one of the, one of the themes of this, um, uh, this talk is supposed to be, there's a cyber threat, what do we do about it? And mm -hmm. so, so to get there, um, I think well, what, what I would say is one of the things we need to do is establish those international norms. And we need to say this is acceptable, this is not, and have that be an international agreement. We don't have that yet. So uh, some people view that sort of thing as, a, a, as an attack, uh, as uh, something that's, that's worth a, uh, a kinetic response. Other people don't. And the United States government has not really nailed that down yet in terms of what our, what our policy is. Well, let's talk for a moment about how you would create those norms. Because you've got 180 countries out there with cyber capability, but you also have criminal groups. Mm -hmm. You have um, hackers. You have teenagers. You can imagine the nation states signing on to international norms. Criminal groups, by nature, ignore international norms. Mm -hmm. 
and teenagers by nature don't sign treaties, at least the ones who live in my house. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you create norms with a threat that goes so far beyond the way nations operate. Same way you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. So the, you, know, you start with the nation states agreeing on what's in, what's out from their point of view. Uh, I think that there are behaviors that, that everybody might agree are, uh, or all nations might agree are unacceptable uh, by anybody. Um, if you recall, uh, back in the days, uh, the early days of this country, there was a piracy problem. And the, the um, folks from the various navies were allowed, if they saw a pirate, to attack and sink that ship. So there's, a, there's an analogy to be made there. Uh, Microsoft has done some good work in terms of, uh, of bots, uh, criminal bots uh, in that regard, working with uh, the Bureau and other folks. And I think that, that sort of um, approach where everybody says that this kind of activity, so you know, criminal botnets that are going after your, your electronic banking information are bad, and anyone who sees them has the authority to take them out. I think there's, there's opportunity for discussions like and, that. And so far we have, even as a country, we haven't gotten to the concept of authority right. to take them out. Um, you mentioned before that a lot of your sensor network is built overseas, and because this is like radar. You know, it's, it's mostly useful to you if you've got early warning. By the time an attack comes into the United States, you've got a 70th of a second to call your meeting together, right? right. Um, so, um, Sometimes those sensors are what we call implants. Uh, software might even be malware put in a foreign network, put in a foreign system. There are other kinds of signals intelligence, obviously, that uh, you have. When we see implants in our system, we get very exercised, exactly as you mentioned before. You get concerned about what you discover in the utility. But when we do it elsewhere, we're sort of viewing it like early warning systems, like putting up a radar system in Australia so that you would see something long before it came to the United States. Um, tell us how you manage that difference in perception. So I think the, uh, the, 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 the difference is, or the, the issue is, um, in the conduct of our authorized foreign intelligence mission, the signals intelligence mission, we use all of our sensors in order to contribute uh, towards that uh, cyber threat warning uh, sort of activities. And so um, uh, if I can uh, quote um, somebody famous, and I can't exactly remember who it was, they said, uh, uh, espionage is illegal in every country in the, na in the world, and every country in the world does it. So I think uh, the, that's qualitatively different, hearkening back to an early part of the conversation, from economic espionage or theft of intellectual property in order to advantage uh, a company's or a, a nation's companies and industries. So we saw this argument come up earlier this year when some of the Snowden revelations, which I and others uh, wrote about, involved a company in China called Huawei, which mm -hmm. makes um, servers that are a competitor to Cisco. And while I don't expect you to confirm what the documents indicated, because I assume you probably want to go back to the office on Monday, uh, uh, but the, the, essence of the, the essence of the story was that uh, the United States had gone inside Huawei's corporate servers in, in China in order to determine first whether the company was run by the PLA, and secondly, to understand their equipment so that if they sold it to another company, another country uh, around the world, you'd understand how to be able to penetrate it. The Chinese reaction to this was, tell me how this is different from all the things that you accuse China of doing and why you blocked Huawei equipment from being sold frequently in the United States. So tell us the difference. So first, thanks for the out. Um, I, you know, one of my career goals is not be the shortest serving deputy director of NSA. So, <laughs> okay. And I have, to, I have to go till October to achieve that. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to comment on any particular uh, uh, story in the press about uh, about our, our intelligence activities uh, or alleged intelligence activities in that way. But I would say that the the difference between uh, what we do and what China is uh, does is that the United States, by uh, policy and legislation, does not provide intelligence information to our commercial entities for their advantage. China does. And China says those are state-owned enterprises, and it's part of the national security. 
so, so we'll agree to disagree. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more thing on, on NTOC. So you do the, the sensor task. We have read in recent times about other elements of uh, the NSA, um, special source operations, which try to go in to, to get at hard to get at elements. And then over on the cyber command side, that seems to be where if there's supposed to be an offensive response, it would, it would get sorted out. How do you integrate, how do you di differentiate what NTOC does from what those other entities do? So NTOC's job is, uh, is to do uh, intelligence on cyber threats and to defend the DOD network. That's what they're responsible for defending. Uh, and so the, um, the functions of cyber command are larger uh, scale defense of the DOD and then on, on command, and with the right authorization to do uh, offensive cyber activity should that become necessary. The reason that Cyber Command is at NSA is because the platform on which you do all those activities is the CryptLogic platform. Um, I, I, keep, I keep quoting General Hayden here, so I'm sorry about that, sir, but uh, just, just so you know, when, when, when we were in the early stages of the predecessor organizations to uh, Cyber Command, one of the points that, uh, that uh, General Hayden uh, successfully made was, 95% of what you would do in an attack is what you do in computer network exploitation, which is part of what we do in the signals intelligence business. And so the, the choice- Can you define that for a minute? Because people understand surveillance, they may not understand exploitation. So if you think about, there's three functions in, in the broader term of computer network operations. There's computer network defan defense, which is protecting your network, defending it from uh, uh, adversary threats. There's computer network attack, which is going after someone else's network with the intention to deny, degrade, disrupt, or destroy that network or the information that it contains. And there's computer network exploitation, which is going after someone's network in order to call out information on it. That's an intelligence function. And so the, um, the uh, things that you do for CNE are about 95% of what you would do for CNA. And so either you could recreate the totality of the National Security Agency uh, cryptologic platform, which would take about 50 years, and I have no idea how much money that would take, but it's a lot. Or you can say, I'm going to co-locate Cybercom with them. The only place where Cybercom and NSA actually intersect is in the person of Admiral Rogers, the director NSA slash commander Cybercom. Everywhere else, it's a, uh, it's a uh, relationship where we, within our Title 10 for Cyber Command, Title 50 for, uh, for NSA, authorities work together. So if there is an exploitation of a foreign system, sort of think of it maybe like a port that a doctor might put in to administer medicine in somebody's body, you can go into that port to, to get information out, and that you would do at NSA. But if you were going to put something into that port to, uh, to, to affect the patient, that is much more cyber command. To deny, degrade, dis disrupt, or destroy, right. But you might be operating through an implant or some other exploit that NSA put in place. So I think the, um, what I would say is that, is that the cyber command, uh, they're standing up um, uh, a number of forces uh, to have their own capability um, to operate in, with their assigned mission. Um, and right now, we're working very hard with them to help train those forces so they can do that. Okay. One last question, and we're going to go out to all of you. One of the big changes of uh, the past year or two is that you have to stand up in public or sit down in public <laughs> in groups like this or talk to my colleagues um, about what NSA does. The CIA was used to this because the CIA runs off of human beings, and human beings, you know, defect or human beings are, get caught and so forth and so on. NSA culturally never really imagined its operations being exposed, discussed, debated, or defended in the press. How's that changed the culture of the place? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, so almost 37 years in this business and for 35 and a half of that I talked to one reporter and since then, I've talked to, I don't know, 80 or 100. Um, and so, so for me personally, it's been huge. For our organization, it's also been uh, very different. We were, you know, we were taught since day one to 
don't talk about what you do. And so part of, uh, part of what we're doing internally is um, figuring out how do we do that? How do we institutionalize the, uh, the need to, and I would argue the responsibility to be transparent, or as someone said uh, last night, at least translucent about, about what we do. Um, I think that, that what, what people should expect from us uh, is that we will be transparent about our authorities, transparent at a macro level about what we do, and transparent about the oversight and the controls and the constraints on that. Because we get, I get, our organization gets, that the, uh, the power to do electronic surveillance, and the power to do the signals intelligence mission is an incredible power, and if it's misused, it can be very dangerous, it can be extraordinarily harmful to the, to the nation and the values the nation espouses. Um, as you've looked at, uh, at the stuff that's come out over the last year and the, the reports and the oversight, uh, the oversight bodies, you find that we haven't actually misused it, but we're still sensitive to as the president said, the potential for misuse. And so, so we get that. And so we're going to be more transparent about those controls, that those laws, those regulations, the policy, the technology, the training, the culture, the ethos that overlie and that constrain and control that, uh, that power. And so um, that we'll be transparent about. We can't be transparent about because it gets to our ability to do our job and increasing risk to the nation is specific operations, specific targets, specific partners. That's where we have to say, okay, that part has to remain classified. That's gonna be uh, a learning conversation for, uh, for us and for all the people that we talk to about where exactly that, that line is. Has it changed your perception of whether or not it is always dangerous to publish classified information or is there a view now within the NSA that there's some classified information that can be dealt with in the open press? I think it's always dangerous to publish classified information. I think if it's something you need to make public, then you declassify it and then publish it. Great. Well, let's go out to some questions out here. We'll start with the young lady here. So a microphone coming to you. Mika, o Mika Oyang with Third Way. Um, We've seen for the President's Review Group uh, references to a left-hand, right-hand problem that the government has. They mentioned the breaking of TOR and the building of TOR. And you mentioned the President's Interagency Group to help us uh, um, address some of these challenges where we may need to have more players at the table than just the intelligence community who is making a very, who has a very limited number of people looking at an intelligence program about whether or not to start that. Can you talk a little bit about how that interagency process is going? Have you changed? or terminated any intelligence programs as a result of the interagency process? So that interagency process you're talking about actually gets to the zero day vulnerabilities and the disclosure of those vulnerabilities. Um, that's the vulnerability um, uh, evaluation process that they've, that they've stood up, unless, unless I'm confused about your question. It wasn't about the zero day vulnerabilities, but there was a suggestion that in the evaluation of starting up an intelligence collection program to be able to look at the risks of potential mm -hmm. um, disclosure of that program later on and determining whether or not from a policy perspective, not just a collection perspective, whether or not that program makes sense. Mm -hmm. now, it was my understanding there's an interagency pro, where there are more voices at the table to evaluate that process now than there were prior to the review group. Yeah, so um, I think what you're, what you're referencing is one of the recommendations that hasn't been acted on yet in the President's Review Group. So there's some of them that they were sent off for further study, and that one. And which recommendation would this be? I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, so, so, so there are um, processes in place. We internally look at it. The DNI looks at it um, in order to say, I've got this new program, and I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, should I implement this or not? Um, we hired last year a civil liberties and privacy officer expressly for that purpose to weigh in on, on uh, programs, and then we work with uh, DNI's uh, CLIPO, Civil Liberties and Privacy Officer, we call it CLIPO, um, in order to do the same thing. But I think the broader interagency uh, aspect that you talk about has not been implemented yet. Well, one program that you've explicitly said you're looking at differently now was um, listening in on, on foreign leaders, where uh, a after the Merkel re revelation, the president came out publicly and said we're not going to be listening in on, on uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, anymore. And I think there was discussion that many other foreign leaders they also stopped listening to. Is there now a formal process where you weigh 
the value of the intelligence versus the risk of the to the relationship if it becomes public? So, so I'm differentiating here, and maybe this is uh, internal government speak between programs and targeting, and there is review uh, by an interagency group of targeting. That did not exist prior to Snowden. That did not exist, that's right. And why didn't it exist prior to that time? Obviously, these are kinds of programs that would know, have a risk. Don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question, sir. Mark Anderson at IP. Hi, Rick. Um, I'd like to, this is a question actually, uh, David, so I will get to it, it'll be very short, but I wanted to say thanks to the NSA. You guys have taken a lot of heat this last 12, 24 months, and um, I just personally in our organization thinks that you're doing a great job. When we look at the thing you pointed out, Rick, about the difference between normal espionage and commercial espionage, we have personally found nothing that violates what you said. We think you're true blue in that way, and you're, you're really standing up for the right things. So um, I would just like to say thank you for all you guys are doing. Thanks. And the question, David, is, um, so when you separate this commercial from the normal espionage, whatever you want to call that, would you talk a, a bit about the commercial side of this and what kind of threat you see there? So I think um, the, the threat from, uh, from China towards uh, U.S. intellectual property has been pretty well documented. Um, it's been pretty well characterized, and it's uh, something that uh, I've seen numbers that range from, you know, hundreds of billions of years, uh, uh, dollars a year um, on up. Um, so I, I think it is serious. It's something that we have to address, and it's something that I think uh, largely gets addressed through those international cyber norms that we talked about, and then have a fallback if there are uh, entities, you know, uh, nations who are particularly recalcitrant in, in how they address that, then the U.S. government has other options they can, they can take. But none of those policy decisions have been made yet. When you look at nations other than China, and the other big threats you hear about are obviously Russia, Iran, North Korea, those are not largely aimed at corporate data by, by and large? China, China stands out. In that regard. Mm -hmm. So if you had to characterize what Russian or Iranian or North Korean goals were, if they are not commercial, what would you say they are? I'd put that in a classified document and not talk about it on stage. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> Look, after this year, you have to leave something classified. Right back here. Dennis Ross, I'm going to pick up what you were just getting at, David, but a little bit more specifically. Uh, we see a lot of published reports about how active the Iranians are. How would you assess their capabilities and how would you assess how they're progressing? So the Iranians, uh, uh, in, in my estimation, are um, aggressively working to increase their capabilities and their, um, I would characterize their glide path as, uh, as very steep, very steep climb in terms of capabilities. Uh, they were believed to have been responsible for the large attack in Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure the U.S. government has ever attributed that. Uh, do, do you believe that they were involved in that attack or any specific attacks on the U.S.? Yeah, that's really hard for me to talk about. Uh, attribution gets into our most sensitive sources and methods. So, Can you tell us a little bit about how, good how much attribution has improved so that mm -hmm. if you took Dennis's question here, if you saw a significant attack in the U.S., on Saudi Arabia, whatever, how, how difficult would it be to say this was Iranian versus this is Chinese versus this is Russian? One of the things that, uh, that folks like to make analogies with in cyber is the nuclear problem, and they sort of will, will often talk about uh, nuclear and cyber in the same sort of a context and make a lot of analogies. Um, this is one where, where um, I think you know, if someone launches a nuclear weapon at you, it's pretty easy to figure out who it was. You follow the plume of smoke back down to the launch site, and it's pretty easy to, uh, to detect that in, uh, in near real time and attribute it in near real time. Uh, but think of, think of uh, a cyber attack as a nuclear weapon goes off in a city, and you have no idea how it got there. Who did that? That wouldn't be an instantaneous, I know the answer, like it would be if it were launched from a, from a silo. 
It's more of a, okay, we have to do forensic analysis. We have to analyze the material and figure out where did that material come from. We have to go back and look at travel patterns and see who brought that, you know, who potentially brought that into the, into the city. And so the attribution in cyber is much more like that latter example. It's not instantaneous and it's not something that is easy, but it, it can be done. Months or years? Uh, no, I think probably if, if you can't get it done in, in a few weeks or a couple of months, then it's probably going to be a, a, maybe a never. Great. Right back here. Ryan? Hey, Ryan Lizard with The New Yorker. Robert, um, I want to go back to uh, Snowden and your assessment of what he may have taken. Originally, the reporting suggested that there was um, nothing that, what I would call in layman's terms, there was no raw intelligence taken. <laughs> And then, of course, Barton Gelman uh, reported in the Washington Post recently that he actually had 12,000 um, emails or files that seemed to have come from 702 collection. Did that report dramatically change your assessment of what Edward Snowden took? Um, and, what, how, and if so, how? So I, I don't want to comment on a specific um, uh, allegation about uh, about material uh, that was involved, but I will say that within uh, within the SIGINT system, there's a difference between raw material and material that has been evaluated and minimized, and so that's a that's a term of art for us. Evaluated means it's been evaluated to make sure it has foreign intelligence value. Minimized means that we've looked at. The, uh, the potential of any U.S. person information and assessed whether it's necessary to understand the intelligence or not. And so um, the, the controls on the raw data are, are very tight. Um, once the data has been evaluated and minimized by an analyst, uh, it's a different control regime. Now, Snowden said he had some access to this in an interview he did recently because he wasn't simply a data administrator, he said he was an analyst. So um, I've been to the ballet, that doesn't mean I'm a ballerina. I think I really um, much would prefer to talk about uh, things going forward than, than talk about Edward Snowden. I think we have we have real serious threats. You heard about some of them earlier in the day. Syria, um, uh, the, the situation all around, all around the Middle East, uh, Russia, Ukraine, um, significant cyber threats. And so I think our conversation should be biased more towards what's the right balance between privacy, civil, civil liberties, and the role of the intelligence community. And I don't think it's a balance, I think it's a how do we do both. Uh, my previous boss, General Alexander, talked about instead of scales of justice, it's a railroad track, you need both, and they both have to work or the train goes off the track. So I want to talk about that in the future, and I want to talk about how do we address those significant threats. I think looking in the, in the mirror at, to borrow a phrase from, uh, from Secretary Chertoff, the contemptible actions of one individual is less productive. Last question for you, because we're running out of time. So when you look at that array of threats, which are the ones that keep you up the most at night? Is it cyber or is it this collection of challenges that we're facing in, in sort of the old and physical world? So I think uh, probably the closest in threat and the one that I think is most likely and most uh, uh, worrisome is the threat of uh, foreign fighters coming out of Syria. Um, earlier folks talked about you know, there's, there's upwards of 10,000 folks in there uh, who have come to learn how to be jihadis. They're being trained, they're being equipped, and they're being sent back home with, with uh, sometimes very uh, clean Western credentials. Um, the border between Syria and Turkey is uh, very porous. There are 3,000 flights, over 3,000 flights a day from Turkey into Europe. Um, think about that. Think about the effect of some wide-scale attacks on Europe. What would that mean in Europe for this whole uh, argument about privacy versus security. And then, of course, there's significant threat to the U.S. from that as well. Um, and then the cyber threat, I think, is one that, that also concerns me. Um, and, and it concerns me for two reasons. One, because we're so heavily wired in as a nation that the effect on the U.S. would be disproportionate uh, to the effect on almost any other country except maybe some Western, uh, 
Western democracies. And the second point uh, is that historically, we've not done a great job of anticipating and act, taking the necessary actions to threats until they happen. Uh, earlier, we talked about the fact, uh, uh, in an earlier session, I talked about the fact that there were reports that came out after the first World Trade Center. There was a report that came out in two, 2000 that talked about the significant impact of terrorism uh, and the potential threat to the United States. Um, we didn't take actions that, that might have prevented a 9-11. I worry uh, about our ability to take actions that will prevent a cyber 9-11 before it happens. I think if it does happen, we'll do all the right things afterwards, but I think uh, the challenge is how do we do that beforehand. Well, thank you very much for uh, this uh, fabulous hour. I think with your last collection of what you're worried about most, you have set up Lisa Monaco uh, brilliantly for after lunch, and you'll be off the stage by then, so you don't have to answer <laughs> how to go deal with those. But uh, thanks very much for uh, this very wide-ranging discussion. Appreciate it.